without further ado, thanks for attending. If anyone needs any help with Zoom, you're welcome to chat with me. Uh, make sure you have your ballot and a pen and any food and drink you might need. And if you want to um, talk, you can either try to catch my attention or Robin's attention with a hand. Or there's also, if you click on the word participants at the bottom, you'll see um, a way to raise your hand um, over there as well. And so we're, that's something to say. Um, and now I'm going to uh, hand over the baton to Robin Temberg, who is Hello. my co-host for tonight. And Robin, take it away. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to see so many faces, and it's exciting in this in this tumultuous time to see everybody uh, wanting to participate in this election. So um, thanks for joining us for this virtual voting party. We're excited to offer this forum for folks to be able to comment on and get more informed about various competitive local races that we have on the ballot this year. And as you know, there are quite a few. Um, generally speaking, Albert will be overseeing who to call on and any technical aspects. Then I'll be loosely overseeing when we shift from one race to another and occasionally, but not much, offering tidbits of useful information or clarification as needed. But mostly we want this to be about you and your input on the races. Albert, do you want to share a little bit more? Phil has asked if we will get the recording and I will post the recording to the Facebook event. And one of those places is here. I will post that over into the chat. So recording uh, later in my life <laughs> will be there. I cannot promise it will be tonight. It might be tonight. All right, so Robin said that. Um, I will just gonna read this part. Our goal is to rotate to various people who have input for the different races. So if you have one or two in particular, please somewhat limit input on other races. We don't want to have anyone dominate the conversation. And let's see, while we don't expect too much to be contentious, our goal is to keep things polite and civil. If you disagree with someone, it's welcomed to give your different perspective, but let's avoid any negativity or attacking a candidate or commenter or issue. Um, we are going to record this in case you want to view it afterwards or if you want to share it with anybody. And if that causes you to be reticent to speak up, you can also, um, we could pause the video. I'm not quite sure we're going to be doing that. You can also add things into the chat and those could be read. And Robin, do you want me to read your part or do you want to kick in now? Uh, no, I'll, I'll take it over. Um, okay. yep. so, our, so if you don't have it already, grab your ballot, grab a drink, grab a pen, um, to, to be in preparation because we're going to launch into things in a minute. Our plan is to go in the order of most ballots, but note that if you're in Northeast Portland or Northwest Portland, you may have some slight differences, notably for the metro and state legislative races. And as a side note, we're not going to be talking about state legislative races as none of them are competitive in our geographic area. There are some outside of the Portland metro area. We'll also be skipping any non-competitive judicial races. There's only, I think, one judicial race that we'll be talking about, and that is a competitive one. I wanted to offer up an opportunity. Sarah Ayanna Roney, who is running for mayor, is here. And so I'm going to ask you to unmute, Sarah. And how about two minutes? Is that OK with you? And then we'll probably come to your race later on, but this will give you an opportunity to introduce yourselves to folks and thank you for joining us. Well, I was just at a house party uh, with Pat Clable and she let me know you are all getting ready to vote. And I wanted to say thank you for your civic engagement um, and be grateful uh, for your willingness to uh, put your vote behind whoever you're deciding for at this time. I did want to drop a link there for you for any undecided voters. We have a hotline set up if you want to talk to me. I'm taking appointments 10 minutes at a time. If you have any questions about my uh, policy positions or platforms, I am happy to talk you through any of them. I just want to say I think this is an important opportunity for Portland as a publicly financed candidate on the ballot. We have a really good chance of unseating uh, the incumbent Ted Wheeler who obviously has not done a very good job dealing with police reform. Today, he uh, defunded the Portland street response, uh, much to Commissioner Hardesty's chagrin. Uh, 
So I think it's important for us to recognize that we have some critical decisions that are going to be made in the in the short term and that having a progressive there who supports a Green New Deal, housing for all, uh, public safety, rethinking of that and drawing down the militarized police budget and reinvesting in community solutions and even tracking as we go through the charter review process to make sure that our government is inclusive and that we're having outcomes that work for everybody regardless of uh, their socioeconomic status, uh, background, or zip code. With that, I don't want to hold up your party too much. You can find out a lot of information about me on my website there at sarah2020.com. Uh, stay healthy and stay well, and thanks for giving me a minute to say hi at your voting party tonight and vote on. Thank you very much. Um, good luck in the election. And thank you so much for running. I, I want to just say to you, and this is really to all people who are running right now, I really feel like, because I've considered running for city council before and why not mayor, um, you know, you're doing this at this, the toughest time in probably Portland's history. I don't know Portland's history back to 18, whatever, but like this is a really tough time to be running for office. So kudos to you for doing it. I mean, it's, my heart goes out to you. Well, and it's an you important win, time for our city. So we all yeah. have to step up, regardless of who's mayor, we all got to be in this because the recovery is going to be hard and long and uh, we have to make sure it's a just one. We have a lot of work to do. So stay in the fight, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks for welcoming me. Thank you, Sarah. Good night. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, now we're going to launch into the ballot. So grab your ballots and I'm going to be using it as a cheat sheet myself. So the first race we're going to be talking about is under state offices. Uh, technically, there is um, the federal offices, which uh, have a presidential race, which I think is relatively important. Make sure that you vote for that, um, as well as uh, U.S. Senator and U.S. Representative, which are uh, pretty straightforward this year. Um, so, but under state offices, we're going to be starting with Secretary of State. There are four candidates in the race, and I do not mean, mean to marginalize the, the minor party candidates, but in this case, it's a, it's a very competitive race between um, uh, Kim Thatcher, who's the Republican, and Shamia Fagan to take over for the, um, the office that Dennis Richardson had and who passed away uh, midterm. So I'll open up the floor to folks who have opinions on, on this race and feel free to comment on any of the four candidates uh, if, you, if you feel the need to do so. Okay. Who wants to start? Um, if you wanna speak, I think best bet is to click on their participants button and then raise your hand and I will see that. But it looks like no one has, oh, Ash, please go for it. Hi everyone, my name is Sky. Um, I actually uh, was part of an endorsement committee this year and I actually got to interview Shamia. So I was, I'm a little familiar with her and some of her policies. Um, <clears throat> the endorsement committee that I am working on is specifically for, uh, we're trying to advocate for family public policies, um, immigrant rights and um, some other agencies within our coalition that are progressive left leaning. Um, Shamia largely, uh, she's been, she's been sitting on, I don't know if she was sitting in the house or in the Senate, but she's been a legislator in, the, in Oregon for a while. Um, she's, her history is pretty impressive. From what I've seen, she's voted for some really important policies. Um, I'm currently text banking for her right now. <laughs> um, I think it's a pretty important race because the current Republican is extremely uh, right leaning. Um, she her personal history, uh, she is, she was raised in a home, or her mother was homeless for a while. Um, so she has some like oppressed, marginalized uh, personal life history as well. She really brings that in and, and she talks about it sometimes um, in her political, uh, her, her talks on the floor and such. So um, yeah, I can't like cite exactly all the different policies that she voted for, but she, she definitely has a, a strong political history in our state. Anyone else have anything they wanna add? We're gonna have, there's gonna be some conversation coming up around some of these issues. So if we don't have anyone feeling passionate to say something, um, on certain races, that's fine too. But I'm just Blair, curious please go if for anybody it. knows anything about Natale Paravicini. 
difficult name to pronounce. Um, so I know Shamia a little bit because I recently retired as a lawyer. I know her as a employment lawyer before she ever ran for office. I think she would be an articulate, wonderful Secretary of State. And it's really important in this state because if the governor leaves office under whatever circumstances, the Secretary of State becomes governor. There is no Lieutenant Governor in this state. Kate Brown became governor when John Kitzhaber resigned as he should have. And if we have a Republican we, uh, in the Secretary of State, that person would be next in line to be governor. Okay, great. Blair, would you like to say anything? Um, yeah, I just, I'm curious, do we have any like polling data? Is this a race that's in danger right now? And there are four candidates, which also always uh, worries me when there's a lot of candidates. Um, and honestly, I don't think Shamia Fagan has like a really attractive name. <laughs> I know that that shouldn't matter to most people, but for, you know, like on the margins, like that does matter. Okay, thanks. Anybody have anything to add to that? All right. So I'll comment on a couple of things that came up and, and I'm gonna try to be objective, even though I have a personal perspective on some of these. Um, this race is extremely tight. Uh, it was extremely tight in 2016 where the Democrat lost. Uh, so I do want to emphasize that component if you're conflicted about whom to vote for, this might be a race where you consider the two major party candidates because it's going to be such a tight race. Um, and someone asked about um, uh, Nat Nathalie Paravicini, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, I don't know anything more about than her than what was in the voter pamphlet statement. Um, but again, I'll, I'll circle back to um, that this is a very close race between Kim and Shamia. Um, and it'll be interesting to see who wins. Uh, the Republicans may hold this office. And the other thing that I wanna emphasize is Secretary of State also will control the redistricting process should the legislature not be able to come to um, an agreement on that process. Okay, Robin, do you wanna move us to the next? Sure, so we'll go for State Treasurer. Uh, again, four people are running. Uh, the two primary candidates are the Democrat and Republican. Uh, this is also a very competitive race. Uh, Tobias Reed is the incumbent, and I'll leave it to folks to make some comments on this one. Okay, if you would like to comment, go ahead and raise your hand. Because waving is not going to catch my attention. I'm looking at all right, looks like no one has comments. So let's move on to the next race. No one at all on the treasure race because it's, it's actually kind of an important one and a very close one. What are your thoughts, Robin? If I, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna leave it to open to other people in case they wanna comment. Okay. I see no raised hands. Uh, okay. So. I've okay. had a raised hand. Did somebody ahead, have a raised hand? No, go ahead, Harriet. I just want to lift up that when it came to the Elliott Forest, that um, that he he voted to protect it, and uh, just reading a, a about him, he seems like he's got a very broad perspective on what can help Oregonians. He seems like the choice. And I'd love other people who know more about him to speak up. Okay, I'm gonna clarify on raising the hand. Phil, I see you. Um, again, if you click on participants at the bottom of your screen, you'll see over on the right hand side, you know, an area will open up where you can click on something that says raise hand. Uh -huh. And that way I'll be able to see, there we go. Phil, you did it, nice. Take it away, Phil. Thank you, I'm Phil Goldsmith. I apologize for not introducing myself before and I've learned a new piece of technology. Um, so I don't know Tobias Reed that well, but there was a major piece of legislation that he and Jennifer Williamson 
um, introduced, shifting entirely the dynamic in class actions. So unclaimed money in class actions for decades, and I represented plaintiffs in class actions, and this was really a killer. It all went back to the defendant. They had an incentive to stall. Now, with this legislation having been passed, and when it was passed, it was Governor Brown's number one priority. The money goes 50% to legal aid and 50% to something called the Oregon Consumer Justice Foundation. And I know the Oregon Consumer Justice Foundation has $36 million. So legal aid must have $36 million too in the ARCO litigation, rather than ARCO getting $72 million back. I think those are 72 million reasons for voting for Tobias Reed. All right, no other hands are up. Okay, so. So the next race is the attorney general race. This one I think will be a relatively quick and easy one. Um, in this situation, it is not a competitive race. The incumbent, uh, Ellen Rosenblum is significantly favored, uh, but there's three candidates running in this race. Uh, if anybody wants to speak uh, towards any of these candidates, if not, we'll. We'll move on relatively quickly from this race. I, Phil, I think I saw your hand, so go for it. So I want to tell this story that that uh, Ellen, was my personal friend, uh, told to the Senate Democratic Leadership Forum. Uh, you, she, Kamala Harris, of course, was used to be the Attorney General of California. Her nephew runs into Kamala Harris in North Carolina and says, you know, my aunt, Ellen Rosenblum, she says, she's a badass. And Ellen Rosenblum is proud to have that reputation. She calls herself the people's lawyer, and she is. All right, thank you, Phil. I don't see any other hands up, so we can move on. So we're gonna jump to nonpartisan state judiciary. And there's uh, several of them that are um, basically unopposed. There is one race, the fourth district position 12, which is very competitive. Um, both candidates are neck and neck from what I understand. And that's Adrian Brown and Gandor. And I'd welcome any input from folks if they have it about this relatively important and very competitive judicial race. Okay, Phil, why don't you hold off? Let's see if anyone else has any comments first. Do, 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 do. Ah, John, Michael, please. Hello. Um, so uh, I have an attorney friend who made a Facebook post about her choice for this candidate. It's a little bit long. But I could try and read it quickly because it seems well informed. Go for it. Um, as a lawyer myself representing regular everyday people in state court, uh, I want my clients to appear before, before judges that have also served in the trenches as a lawyer in the same court where they now preside. To be clear, the current position is not a family law position, so I will likely never appear in front of blah, blah, blah. Rima Gandapur is has extensive state court experience Adrian has no state court experience. This means Adrian is running for a judicial position in a court in which she has not practiced. Adrian is smart and capable, but the issues dealt with in federal court are very limited compared to state court. To the best of my knowledge, she has never represented a paying client, and I'm concerned she will not have the grasp on issues related to attorney's fees and conduct that a judge needs to have. She also doesn't have the basic legal working knowledge of these cases. Anyone can read a statute or a court rule, but you have to know the nuance of how those laws fit together. Uh, Rima is exceptionally qualified. She has also done a lot of work to make the courts more equitable and support professionalism in our community. It just wasn't her full-time job. Sadly, Adrian has misrepresented Rima's experience as part of her negative campaign mailer. It's frankly beneath Adrian to do this and I expect she is getting bad advice from her campaign staff. So it's it's actually quite long, but that's um, that's a snippet from my friend who is a family law attorney. Great, thank you, John Michael. Mm -hmm. Phil? 
he caught me uh, caught me with food in my mouth. Um, so here's what I'm going to say. This, this I could say a lot more. I think that these two candidates are both exceptionally fine candidates. Um, I think that John and Michael's friend's analysis of Adrian's abilities are misplaced. And she, she hasn't practiced in state court because she created a position which hadn't existed in the um, US Department of Justice in the state of Oregon for maybe 15 years, a full-time civil rights lawyer. So, you know, when the city, when the United States sues the city of Portland, for example, for the killing of James Chassie and the mishandling of other mentally ill people, that's in federal court, right? It should be in federal court. You got a federal judge who's got more powers. She worked on that case. Joanne, she met Joanne Hardesty. She was just doing leg work. Joanne Hardesty was just a citizen. Joanne Hardesty endorses her. Um, both of them have tremendous endorsements. Both of them have great strengths. I was not planning to vote for Adrian Brown until I went to a house party for her where there were maybe a quarter of the number of people that are here. And now I am, but I have a really good friend who's doing a house party on Sunday and we had a long conversation and I read all the qualifications for Rima. And here's what I would like people to do if they want to. Um, I will have ways of getting a hold of Governor Brown through friends of mine who went to law school with her. And I would like people to be, be willing to sign on to a letter after the election that says essentially some of us voted for Adrian, some of us voted for Rima. It was a hard choice of both extremely well qualified. One of them won, one of them lost. We urge you, Governor Brown, the next time you have a candidate, you have a vacancy to uh, fill in Multnomah County, you appoint the one who lost to the bench because we think they're both extremely well qualified. And if you're interested in doing that, uh, put your email address in the chat. You can send it to me privately and I'll contact you after uh, the election. Actually, um, why don't you, Phil, put your email address in the chat and people can contact you. No, that's even better. Thank Actually, you. I have, I think I, I sent something to somebody who I know um, and I think I can put my full footer up to my, yes, I can. All right, oh, thank have you, have all my contact information. Super duper. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Okay. Any other comments about the specific candidates? And I agree, we've got two great candidates here from everything that I've heard about them. So it's not a lot of races, it's choosing between a lesser of two evils. So it's nice to have two great choices here. Okay, speaking of big races, the next one, we're gonna be shifting to the city of Portland and hey, we've got Robin. a hot, hot mayor's race. Robin, one sec, um, Kat okay. has her hand up. Go for it, Kat. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, yeah, so friend of mine um, who's been a public defender for many years also endorses Gandor and just said about her, um, She's been endorsed by many people and organizations that I support. I've worked with her personally and like and trust her. She's volunteered tons for migrant folks targeted by the Trump regime. And the one that matters most to me is that she's been endorsed by her defeated opponent, Sonia Montalbano, who I supported in the primary. So that's just another opinion on the subject. Thanks, Kat. I have a question. Go for it, Beth. Oh, yeah, my question is, is um, does anyone know why um, Joanne Hardesty is supporting Adrian Brown instead of Rima? Uh, Phil, go ahead. Sorry, I absolutely know that. So when and I tried to say that earlier. So in developing the case against the city of Portland for its mistreatment for police mistreatment, that Adrian Brown did is she went around the community to talk to people. And one of the people she talked to was Joanne. Um, I think this was even before Joan Hardesty was the head of the NAACP in Portland, but you know, she's been involved in trying to reform the police for 30 years. 
And she was so impressed by those conversations that she endorses uh, Adrian. Um, and I, as long as I have the floor, it's true that Sonia Montal Montalbano uh, endorsed uh, Ad uh, Rima Gondor, but Ernest Warren, who is a black man, you know, in, in Rima Gondor is an Arab woman and an immigrant, um, endorses Adrian Brown, I think because of Adrian Brown's civil rights work experience. It, this is a race where you, you can just match the endorsements and say, well, my friend X endorses one of them, my friend Y endorses the other of them. Okay. Vote your, vote your conscience. Great, thank you, Phil. Um, and if it happens that we're having a conversation versus, you know, starting to talk about a candidate or an initiative, feel free to just unmute yourself and speak up. You don't have to raise your hand. Um, so back to you, Robin. Okay. As I was alluding to, we have a very hot mayor's race for the city of Portland between Ted Wheeler and Sarah Iannarone. And I'm sure this is going to uh, cause a lot of people to want to comment on it. Uh, there is also a writing candidate, Teresa Rayford. Um, but the two, it's neck and neck between Ted and Sarah. And I think it's safe for me to say that those are the two potential winners in this race. Um, but I know that a lot of people have strong feelings about all three. So I'll, I'll open up the floor and I'm really interested to see where this conversation goes. So this is an opportunity to raise your hand, uh, John Michael. I just uh, was wondering if anybody knows, uh, has Teresa Rayford said anything about the write-in campaign for her? Um, my concern is that uh, if it gains some momentum, uh, but isn't enough to get her elected, is it gonna uh, take votes away from uh, Sarah Ayanna Roney? Um, and I personally don't wanna end up with Ted Wheeler again. So I was curious if anyone knows if Teresa Rayford has an, a, an opinion or a point of view on the write-in campaign for her, because I'm not even sure that she's necessarily involved in it. Um, I can speak a little bit on that. Um, first of all, it's Teresa Rayford. Um, and um, she runs Don't Shoot Portland. And her official response is, is that she's been working already in the community and she doesn't have time but she's in full support of her candidacy and her write-in campaign. I also noticed that a lot of people um, dismiss her because they're afraid of basically giving a vote to Ted Wheeler, but I really feel like it would be helpful instead of dismissing her if people did kind of look into her and take her seriously as a candidate. And I just feel like the conversation around it, at least the conversation that I've been hearing is not anything about her record, but more like if you vote for her, it's a vote for Ted Wheeler and people neglect to kind of look into her, into her background, which I think is pretty strong. Personally, I feel like I consider reparations in a big way for Black Lives Matter. And in some ways, when I consider reparations, this is an, a perfect example of a way um, to follow through on reparations. I'm not saying I want Ted Wheeler as mayor, but I'm just saying that I wish that there was more content about the conversation about, about her and the ways that she could be a, um, a, a viable and a super experienced candidate that's gonna bring a lot of different voices into, uh, into our city. Um, I just wanted to say I did vote for her in the primary, and I would, and I would prefer that she were uh, actually on the ballot. Um, but given our current situation, uh, I do have the concern that you said a lot of people do have about ending up with Ted Wheeler. Okay, next up we have Yasmin. Hi, um, I was just wondering if we can fact check what Sarah and Aaron, uh, had said about Ted Wheeler um, earlier in terms of uh, dismantling the, uh, what is it? Street patrol. Street patrol. So that's an important new fact, if it's true. Right, it's not that new as far as I know, but um, does anybody have thoughts about that? That, that can jump in? 
Um, if not, we're going to move on to Blair, and that can also come up in our discussion of this uh, race as as it needs to. Someone wants to look into that, Blair. I'm not going to say anything about the candidates. I just think this is a really interesting game theory problem that we have here. So we have a three-way race, um, and it's kind of an out. We have a, like if Ted Wheeler could be like the nefarious Republican, um, and Sarah Anaron could be the Democrat, and now we have a third-party candidate. This is exactly the same thing um, as we see in our some of our national races. So I just I want people to you know maybe think of it from a from a non-emotional perspective. Anyway, I'll cede the floor now. All right, thanks, Blair. Um, next up, we have Kat. Yeah, this has been a really interesting race for me because I, I know Sarah and I've known her for quite a while and I spoke about her when we had the election in the spring. And um, what I've come to realize is that I feel like what she stands for in terms of climate justice and housing and police brutality is, is very much in alignment with my values and what I want to see happen. And my concern about her has been like, will she actually be able to make that happen? Like is Portland actually ready for those kind of changes um, on this grand sweeping level that her vision holds? And I've just personally in the last couple of um, weeks in my own like political self-education, like come to the realization that like locally and on a nationwide scale, like we just kind of need to throw our hat over the fence and go for things that are like the more radical solution. And I understand that um, Teresa also has a lot to offer, but um, she only won 10% in the spring election. And so the chances, whereas like the race between Ted and um, Sarah is very close at this point. So I don't know, I guess that's just my two cents for like, for me, Sarah feels like a stretch already to, to vote for her and to vote for what she stands for. But what she stands for is very much in alignment with what I stand for. And, um, you know, I don't know where other people lie on those subjects, but it would not just be a statement for Portland and obviously a challenge for her and her people to implement her vision, but it would also be a, um, like really an example. There's a lot of um, news coverage of Portland these days, and it would be kind of this like example for other cities around the country to take on some of these issues, like going net zero as a, as a city, like in a more radical way. So I think there's something really cool possible if we get her into office. All right, um, Phil, did you wanna speak on the mayor's race? Yeah, um, I voted for Teresa Rayford in the primary. I voted for Teresa Rayford in the primary in part because she was endorsed by the National Lawyers Guild, which I'm a member of. I'm in the same position, I have the same belief as John uh, Michael that well, Teresa Rayford would probably be the better candidate and it would be very symbolically would be very important for Portland to have a black mayor. Um, she's not going to win and she's going to take votes away from Ted Wheeler, or, sorry, from Sarah Ayanna Rome and create the risk that we get Ted Wheeler as mayor. I actually argued that position when the National Lawyers Guild was trying to figure out whether it should endorse Teresa Rayford's write-in campaign. Um, so um, that's all I wanted to say. Okay. Uh, Alex and Stephanie, did you guys want to weigh in? Hey, yeah. Hi, this is Stephanie. Um, I want to, you know, admit that I'm not, I don't have the advantage of having every, um, like, all the political knowledge or time to research every candidate, but I have an anecdotal 
experience or two that I thought was worth sharing. Um, I work for the city of Portland, one of the bureaus, and um, have seen, I've seen Mayor Wheeler really handle the budget, you know, a potential budget crisis um, and other really difficult kind of bureaucratic um, challenges that have, that have come up for the city um, in a way that always centers, that always centers racial justice and climate um, and progressive climate um, at least, at least within the work that we're charged to do with the city, um, I've have constantly admired his leadership. Again, I haven't tuned into all of the debates to kind of weigh issue by issue who I who I feel more aligned with. Um, but I have I, I sometimes work on uh, or work with one of the advisory bodies to Portland City Council and was working on one of one of these committees when uh, Sarah, I don't want to mispronounce her name, I'm just going to go for it. Is it Sarah Ianna Roan, um tuned in and had a, had a really negative reaction to a presentation that my, that my group was doing um, that, didn't, that didn't feel personal, but felt like she wasn't hearing like the issues in the larger context and someone was was speaking earlier and and I kind of I I uh in maybe naming they weren't sure how uh how effective she would be at getting um maybe her more progressive values um in an actionable uh or make, making progress on them I suppose um and I kind of I kind of feel that way myself. Um, I, I actually find myself aligning with her, with her values, but in seeing um, how abrasive her approach was to a city council advisory body, I was really turned off and, and disappointed that um, she wasn't, I guess, more, more willing to have a conversation versus launch an attack. unless you have anything to share, I'll, no. I'll end it there. All right, thanks so much, Stephanie. Welcome back from your road trip. Um, before we go to you, Harriet, I just wanted to mention someone texted or someone shared with me on the chat uh, a comment that she is not comfortable or willing to share directly, so I will read it. And she asks, what about the United for Portland campaign against Sarah? Looks like big money backing them. And then she followed that up with, I'm concerned about her tweeting that seems a lot like Trump and wondering why the United group is so against her. Um, Harriet, you're up. And we do have some more people who are gonna comment. So um, should just I'll, know I'll, that. I'll be short. I really appreciate okay. what Stephanie had to say. Um, I feel a more grounded presence when I listened in the debate with Ted and Sarah there's just something with Sarah for me that just feels like she's in her head in the ideas, but I don't feel a groundedness there. Um, I did have the opportunity to sit in on a small meeting that some folks had pulled together. There were seven. There were some really challenging individuals. And Wheeler was incredibly respectful to everyone and listening. And um, I've just seen him react that way. I think he's changed. He's been changed by our community, um, and I think he shares our values. Okay, next up is Brenda. Hey there. You probably have to fact check anything I say. Sorry. Um, you know, one of the things I like what you said about, you know, the way that Sarah comes back at things seems kind of Trumpish. There's just a part of me that has been watching these politicians and um, I can't believe some of the behaviors and the way that they react, that they get away with it. And, and uh, I question the way that Sarah shows up. I think that Ted has got a bit of a bad rap. I think he's a human being that's had a hell of a lot go on during his time and um, has made progress. Um, but I am kind of tired of 
the politicians and the people that are um, obnoxiously loud and, and just not as collaborative and even as professional as I'd like to see them. Like, not like professional stuffy, just like values and um, ways of being that allows us to uh, listen and, and be with each other and collaborate to a solution. So my fear is that's not where Sarah is to support particularly the progressive things she wants to do. Great, thanks Brenda. Tina? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't really think that Sarah is a, a great candidate and I wish that there was somebody else who I felt more comfortable with in terms of um, experience and all kinds of things. So uh, I don't necessarily favor Sarah. However, I've been following closely the protests downtown um, as well as um, for me, what I consider is a serious threat of all of the, the right wing and the Patriot prayer and all those guys and having the Portland police be an arm of the uh, pretty much fascism. And so for me, in terms of the climate nationally and internationally, that's like a big important piece for me. And I've watched Ted Wheeler not be in favor of what I say, my values and the values of the protesters downtown who are really, really keeping up, you know, they put themselves in, in, in danger every night for what is 150 nights so far. And I just feel like based on that, I see that Ted Wheeler is gonna be much better on the budget. He's gonna be much better at a lot of things. But the thing that is important to me is how he's responded to the protests downtown and how he really has failed to do anything about the police. So for me, not that I think that Sarah is gonna do any better, but she's at least gonna put um, Joanne Hardesty in the, in the police commissioner spot. And so for me, if nothing else, having um, Joanne as the uh, police commissioner, I think that's gonna be a much bigger difference than what we have now with Ted Wheeler. Thank you. Thanks, Tina. Um, if anyone who hasn't spoken yet tonight would like to chime in, now's a good time. Just go ahead and unmute yourself. And otherwise- This is one reason where I'm gonna, I'm gonna comment on um, and, and what I want to share is that everyone running has flaws. There's no great candidate in this race. So it's more, but are you happy, are you happy with the direction the city is going? Um, I was an early backer of Ted Wheeler four years ago, opposed to him now. Uh, in my humble opinion, he's been bad on environmental issues, whether it's liquid national gas, terminal, the oil terminal. Uh, he has not been helpful on air quality issues. Um, he has been really just not helpful on environmental issues in general. He's been supported by big developers and this new pack that has uh, emerged is, is an example of that. And he has a track record of getting very little done. Um, I don't like to with the protesters downtown and then did not rein in the police afterwards. Um, overall, I've just been very disappointed by him, and I think that for, for a new voice in City Hall, I, I support Sarah, and I support because, um, frankly, I, I don't think Teresa can win, and uh, it's important to vote for someone who's viable in this race, and so that's why I'm voting for Sarah. All right. Thanks, Robin. I'm going to encourage you to turn off your video background. Um, yeah, and it's back to you. I think that's the last of the comments on this race, so back at you. Okay, um, so the next race is another very competitive race, uh, city commissioner uh, between Mingus Maps and Chloe Daly. Uh, Chloe is the incumbent, and this is a very neck and neck race, so I'll be, and I think there's gonna be some strong emotions on this one as well, so I'll be very curious to hear what people have to say about this race. Yeah, and I'd love to encourage people who haven't spoken yet, um, or who haven't spoken a lot, to please chime in. I know many of you, and I'm very curious about your quietness tonight, because I know that if you were in my living room, it would be a much rowdier experience. So go ahead, Avi. 
You know, um, I was doing some, some Googling about uh, this claim that Ted had defunded Portland Street Response. I don't see a single news item out there saying that. I see lots of news items saying that he- I'm just gonna going... jump in to say we're, we're now on to the next race. Of... I, I, un I understand that. I just wanted to backtrack a little bit and just say that there was a claim made. I don't see any news stories to support that claim. Okay, thanks, Avi. Um, so given that we were on the Chloe Mingus race, um, who would like to speak about that race? I will. Why don't I start things off? Okay, Albert, please go ahead. Um, gosh, so I have been doing some Portland politics for many years on some level or another. And this is a tough one. This is a real tough one because I I've never had uh, a champion for issues that I've brought before the city council um, a couple of times, Nick Fish um, a little bit, um, Amanda once in a while, but Chloe uh, has been a big champion of something that I have been pushing for recently, which is getting rid of gas powered leaf blowers. And I'm working with a group, Quiet Clean PDX, and we've been pushing at every level you can imagine um, next door to the state house, state capitol, to get rid of these things. They're terrible. Um, and I hope you'll join me on that. But um, Chloe, when she uh, heard from us, was um, one of the city council members that voted in favor of a ban uh, by the city on procuring any new ones and switching over to electric for starters. And um, also, when I've gone before the city council on the issue of trees, which is another area that I spend a lot of time on. Um, she, uh, I, I said sort of jokingly, I mean, it's no joke, but I really think that we ought to have a moratorium on cutting down trees pretty much globally. But, you know, for me, it's the city of Portland where I live. And um, she heard that phrase and she started to say it. And I thought, wow, that it, like either I'm brilliant or I've got like somebody who's actually listening and open to listening to my wild ideas. And I was very impressed. Um, that said, um, I really feel like this time in our city's history that we need somebody who's more stable um, as a recipient of information and as a uh, just participant in city life. And I watched how her office dealt with the neighborhood association issue. Um, I understand that the neighborhood association system could use improvement. Um, I've watched her just be behind the, um, you know, behind the desk at a city council meeting and just be very, um, very reactive in a way that I didn't feel was very professional. And I understand that people on the other side of the desk coming towards her are throwing things at her, you know, I mean, they're not literally throwing things at her, but they're throwing noise and, you know, craziness sometimes. And um, I've watched her kind of like be the crazy back. And I watched you do that during the election with Steve Novick. And at the time I thought, well, Steve Novick isn't really that impressive to me. So um, yay, let's have a change. But this time I've had a chance to now watch Mingus Maps on the campaign trail. And I've been on a house party with him. And I have to say, I'm just looking forward to somebody who's like feels calm, um, consistent, strong, clear, um, and I'm, I'm just super excited to have uh, also a black man on the city council. I think he's going to be uh, a real improvement. Um, and I'm sad to say that because I had a lot of faith in Chloe and I know she's done a lot of good for our city as well. So that was my time. And next up we have Brenda. Yes, there you go. Um, yes, so. I just want to ditto what you said, Albert, and uh, it just, um, the lack of professionalism and the reactiveness and the lack of groundedness that come from that, from Chloe, is just something that's just <laughs> sickening to me. It does not contribute to collaboration. And I really like the way Mingus is showing up. Um, 
And I love that, you know, he's a black man too. I think he's capable and I think um, he'll bring some good collaboration in. Okay, um, Yasmin. We have an opinion here from someone who worked with uh, Chloe. Oh. Right. oh um, no, I'm sorry. I, have, I haven't personally worked with Chloe oh. Daily. I have, um, I'm, I'm a landlord tenant lawyer <laughs> and Chloe Daily is in my professional opinion. Well, she, I agree with her goals politically. The laws she has drafted have caused a lot of people a lot of problems just because they're not well written and in many cases not well conceived. Like we appreciate what they're trying to do, but some of it's kind of a nightmare to enact. So just speaking as someone who cares about the quality of legislation, I was not a fan. Um, and I have also heard that she's been very, very difficult to work with and that's not great, but I can't offer any more real solid information about that. I just know that the laws that the city council has passed have been awkward. Mm -hmm. um, to work with. Great, right, thank you. And it, who are you, by the way? Oh, hi, my name is Jay Bodson. I'm an attorney at Kibble and Howard. I do a lot of landlord tenant law these days, um, trying to stop people from being evicted unlawfully. Um, but uh, I, I do other things, but that's what's been really relevant on, on the ballot here right now. Great, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And why don't we move to Jay Brodsky? Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask, I, I'd heard some reports, I don't know how true this is, but I heard some reports that Mingus Map got a large donation from the Portland Police Department. Um, I don't know exactly what is going on with that. I'm having a hard time finding facts about Chloe versus Mingus in this race. So I'm wondering if anybody knows what's going on with Mingus Map and support for the police. Um, I am not a huge fan of the Portland Police Department, let's just say that. So I, I would not feel comfortable voting for somebody as one of these uh, city positions where they are essentially okay with the way that the, the current police system works in Portland. Okay, thank you, Jay. Um, next up, Avi. Um, I do not have direct knowledge of this aside from what I heard on Think Out Loud. Uh, I think it was this afternoon. They had Chloe and they had Mingus and it was sort of a modified debate format where the moderator was asking one of them a question then getting a response from the other one. And on the question of the uh, police, um, the police union contribution, apparently they gave Mingus, I think it was $16,000. Um, Chloe hit this very hard saying that no organization would give any kind of money to a serious candidate unless they expected something in return. And Mingus's response was that he has the lived experience of being an African-American man who is raising African-American kids and nobody needs to tell him about things need to change for the police department. And just because they gave him $16,000 does not mean that they've bought anything. That was the extent of it, take it for what it's worth. Yeah, I've, I've heard him say that uh, as well. Um, all right. Last chance to discuss the city council race. Who hasn't spoken yet that wants to? Phil, hold on. Anyone else? Going, going to Phil. Can I speak? Oh, oh, Sydney, go ahead. Yep. Sorry, Alfred. I'm not sure how this works. Other than um, the thing I like about Mingus, and it's also the same with, and not to backtrack on Ted Wheeler, is I feel that they're a calming presence and that they're going to be willing to collaborate and willing to bridge um, things. And that's that's where I stand on that. And I read somewhere, in, well, I think it was in the Willamette Week, that that donation was in kind. I think they did some copying for his uh, campaign materials. All right, Phil. 
excuse me, <clears throat> I gotta get myself unmuted. Um, so this is, I have a very, very good friend who went to college with Mingus and who has strongly advocates for him. And it, the last time I had to figure out whether I wanted to vote for him or for Chloe Udaly is when the voters pamphlet came out and Chloe Udaly is endorsed by both senators. She's both endorsed by Steve Novick who beat her, who she beat in the last election and by a whole lot of other people I respect. So then I tried to figure out what I could about Mingus. Mingus, you mean, Mingus had, has the PhD in political science was teaching at Brandeis University, um, a policy, political science and so, sort of with an emphasis on social change um, and decided that rather than being in academia, he wanted to be involved in the life of the community and he moved to Park Rose to help uplift Park Rose. I, I don't know how many people know Park Rose. I used to play table tennis in Park Rose. It's not the pearl. It is a low income community and it's not, and it's more Latino, I think, than black, although I'm not sure of the, of the demographics and there's a lot of poor whites. And I thought if that was a really significant act and that's part of the reason why I ended up being back in supporting Mingus Maps. And you can find that if you Google him. All right, thanks, Phil. Blair? So after four years of Trump trauma, I just need normal. I can't handle any more confrontation. So Mingus is a perfectly nice guy. Um, you know, I, uh, that's good enough for me. For anyone who doesn't understand, oh, okay, I'm sorry, Bev Q, please. Hey, I think I'm in the minority here in supporting Chloe Udaly. Um, but I just wanted to say she is divisive and she is bold and she has a lot of courage and that's why I support her. When you stand up against power, it gets really messy and she hasn't backed down and she hasn't given up. Thank you very much. May I, may I say something about I can't figure out how to raise my hand. Digitally. That's fine, Lark. Go ahead. Sorry, Albert. Um, so I, I put a quote in the chat. So I'm just going to direct people's attention to that, um, in which Mingus Maps spoke to that contribution. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. OK. I didn't see it in the chat. OK. Um, Feel free to oh, post it again. There we go. I just okay. posted it. Thanks. Oh. Um, yeah, and for anyone who can't figure out how to raise your hand, why don't you just go ahead and jump in if you'd like to right now. We'll have a little cacophony for a moment. Or maybe we're done with this race. That's fine too. Okay, Robin, back to you. I think we're just reading. So uh, we are on to the Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, I don't know if many people have opinions. Um, they are competitive races. Um, if there's not a lot of opinions, we'll just pass over it quickly, but I'm hoping that some folks can give us some insights. Uh, we'll be in, and I'm tempted to, to lump them all together, but let's, let's go one at a time in case there are comments for each one. Uh, the first one that I have at least is uh, at large one, uh, Devin Portwood, Rick Till, and James Carlson. I'll speak to that. I've been doing a little research on it. Um, and, oh, you've disabled screen sharing. I was going to just share the research that I had looked up. Is that possible? Albert, can you do that? Yeah, I'm um, sorry. I don't see why you shouldn't be able to. In many places, I found that you couldn't Try find it. anything about Rick Till, um, but I did finally find this bit of information about him, um, which felt positive to me that he has a background as a wilderness 
ranger, trail technician. Um, he's got a JD in environmental resources from Lewis and Clark. So he's got the um, uh, Sarah, legal you're, understanding of it. Yes. You, you're sharing. There you go. Um, and so he's worked. Is that big enough that people can actually read it? If you want to, I can if make it a can, little bigger. Yeah, you, um, if you could click on uh, view on full screen, you should people should be able to see it. Okay, I made it a little bigger too. Um, so I just liked, you know, I found his, and so you know, he looks like he's got his head in the right place about soil and water. Uh, I looked up Devin Portwood and James Carlson, and uh, is it this one? This one? Yeah. So they're, you know two nice kind of friendly dorky pictures but don't really say much about what they're doing um, practical side of going green with no specifics and um, and then Jim Carlson on the right wants to add new ideas to the board but doesn't really say what those ideas are and that's what I found thanks Sarah um, next up Aaron Oh, thank you. You know, it took me so long to figure out how to raise my hand. I, I should know this this many months of the pandemic. I'm I'm behind. I had a comment at the last. The no, last. go ahead, Aaron. Share it. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Well, I guess with both Sarah and around Sarah that's running for mayor, I'm her and Claire U. Daly. Both I'm. I guess both those people. I'm afraid of their just kind of potential volatility um, and hearing that they don't always work so collaboratively. Um, and I guess that's always a fear of mine. I was really impressed with Mingus Maps um, being on one of these like Zoom calls with him recently. I just think he came off as very intelligent and diplomatic. And I do like the idea of another black person in leadership um, who has a lot of, I don't know, seems to have good intentions, so. That was it. Um, oh, and I also just mentioned the Chloe Daly, and I'm embarrassed. I feel like I don't po follow local politics enough, but with those landlord tenant things, I've just known of a lot of people on the landlord side getting into a really bad situation with tenants that are now selling their rental properties because they've just been, I, I mean, it's good to protect tenants, but I feel like there needs to be a balance. And if there's a well-intentioned landlord, like they need to like, feel like they're not going to lose their life savings and it, it it's just it, it just seems like such a complicated mess and I, I feel like it needs to have a little more balance and so I'm scared if it continues to going that way and um the people wanting to get rid of their rental properties because of fear of the complications I'm afraid actually it'll end up making so there's less affordable potential rentals for people that need to rent because maybe nobody wants to be a landlord anymore <laughs> unless they're a large corporate landlord but just my personal perspective Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Aaron. If you thank you, Aaron, if you um, have a comment on a previous race and didn't get to say it, um, please feel free to. There, we did. We've been moving at a good pace. Um, and so, back to Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District. Does anyone have any more information on the uh, at-large position one? selection of people. And if not, we can just move on and, and do further research. The Willamette Week now has their endorsements up, by the way. So Michelle, go ahead. Hello. Yeah, sorry. So um, I actually heard it in a couple different places. Um, and I'll read one of the comments I got on Messenger. So on the Soil and Water Conservation District, um, somebody wrote, there's a bit of a reactionary coup being attempted. Uh, I have two important recommendations to ensure that equity and sustainability efforts are cultivated. Um, for zone one, they recommended Laura Masterson, um, Rick Till for, I think that was, for that zone one. Um, and then the Jasmine Sicker Stucky. And then I saw it on a different thread on Facebook, the same recommendations also from some other folks that kind of were 
Portland hive mind kind of thing. So not a lot of information, but just wanted to share that. All right, thank you so much. Good to see you, Michelle. Michelle's my neighbor. She came to our yep. block party last year. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, Beth. Seth, so on my ballot, I don't have any choices. There's just one person for each. Uh, for the East Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District? Oh, mine just says Multnomah Soil. And no, mine is West. Yeah. So yeah. it's just but nothing. The West doesn't have competitive races. The East side does. Oh, okay. All right, Robin. Um, just a slight correction. Uh, Willamette Week and Portland Mercury do not have endorsements in this race. Um, and uh, in the for what it's worth category, I've heard good things about Rick Till for uh, position one. Um, but moving along, um, just making sure there's no other comments about the the soil dis soil and water district. Okay, so now we're on to ballot measures on the back. I, I believe it's going to be on the back side of your ballot. And um, a number of these are easy votes and a number of them are competitive votes. Um, so um, measure 107. Actually, Robin? Yes. We skipped over East Soil and Water Director at large number two. Oh, I thought we talked about them all <laughs> in the course no, of the but if, okay, let's, but if let's no one has here. something to say I, about that I think that I one. gave a recommendation on that one. I okay. think I did all three. Just an FYI. Okay. But sure, we'll go one by one. If, if, does anybody else have any opinions on um, uh, District 2, uh, Jasmine Zimmer Stuckey versus Lars Grandstrom? Uh, Sarah Hope Smith. I'm muting, it helps. Um, again, I'm going to just screen share. In a number of places I looked, I found no information submitted by Grant Izelli. Um, and uh, for Laura Masterson, again, I'll go ahead and try and increase my screen size so that you can read about her. So, so more. since we're going one by one, can we focus on District 2 and then hold off on uh, uh, the, the, the Laura Masterson race for the moment? Well, since I'm here, do you want me to? Yeah, right. let's just, Robin, let's roll with that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so she's an organic farmer with experience on her organic farm. I like that about her um, past 24 years. She's been on the Ag Board. She seems to have a knowledge of how to work with land and using cover crops and um, so it seems like she's got practical um, hands-on knowledge about how to actually care for the land. Um, so I like that about her. And I can put that link in the share. Okay. So we did, so we went, we did the uh, at-large one We've had a little bit on at large too. Does anyone have anything to say about any more of the Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District races? Why don't we do that? And I see none. So let us move on. I'm just gonna add that I, I support Laura Masterson for that final race there. Um, okay, so let's move to the backside. State legislative measures. What about Metro Council District 5? Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. I apologize. It's not in, in on my ballot, and that's why I moved on. So thank you for jumping in on that. That's a very, uh, there's actually two Metro races that are very important. Uh, is, is District 5 Chris Smith and Mary Nolan? OK. So thank you. Um, so let's talk about that. Very competitive race. Uh, Mary Nolan, former state uh, legislator, Chris Smith uh, has served on the Planning Commission and a variety of boards. Um, they are the two finalists for, for the Metro seat that has been vacated by Sam Chase for when he ran for city council. And let's talk about that. Let's talk about Metro. Yeah, and this is gonna be a race that not everybody has a chance to vote on, but if you have input on it and nobody so far is raising their hand, if you can't figure out how to raise your hand and you wanna speak, just go ahead and talk. 
I was sad about this race. Um, someone I liked ran in the primary and did not win, Mary Pevito, who is the head of Neighbors for Clean Air. And um, hopefully she'll run for another race another time because she's awesome. So I can volunteer that my son who works for Metro um, has worked with Chris Smith and uh, his personal feeling was that this was a this was the right person for the job. Um, I know it's really close, and that's a very personal comment from my son. But he's on the inside at Metro, so I volunteer <laughs> that. Thanks, Yehuda. All right, let's move on, Robin. Okay, and then also I will just comment briefly. Is any, does anybody have the race with uh, I believe it's Garrett Rose? I may be mispronouncing Garrett Rosenthal. It's another Metro race. No. Okay, we'll skip that then. Okay. Anybody else have anything else on the ballot before going to the backside, or at least that's what I have on the backside for state ballot measures. Okay, so we'll move on to that. So. Um, Measure 107 allows laws limiting political campaign contributions and expenditures, requiring disclosure of political campaign contributions and expenditures, and requiring political campaign advertisements to identify who paid for them. A brief background in case it's useful for folks. Um, there were preclusions to allow for campaign finance limits. Oregon is one of several states that don't have any limits at all. Uh, at the city and county level, uh, there have been some uh, court affirmed limitations on uh, campaign finance uh, donations, and this is to allow for that to happen and be codified in state law. Excuse me. Hey, Helda, go ahead. Yeah, when when we were on the the previous candidates, I was waving and muting, and I didn't. I didn't say anything. So I, when you're through discussing this, I don't want to interrupt the flow, but I'd like to go back to that, uh, the, the, one of the, the candidate, uh, Chris Smith, who I've known for years. Go for it, Hilda. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, he's pretty dedicated to the city and he's volunteered a lot of time on working on issues of transportation, which is his major focus. But he's also um, worked on a number of other issues, historic preservation and land use planning. And he seems to study the issues. He's very solid, very knowledgeable, and um, not especially capricious. He's a rather quiet fellow. Um, Mary Nolan is much more outgoing. Um, but if we, you want knowledge and a long history of devotion to making Portland a better place, he's, he, he's really in there. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Hilda, I'm curious, how did you find us? Oh, I found, I found you through Joni Levine. Great. Thank you. I dropped in last year and it was so good. But, oh. And I, I don't have much time, so I just had to drop in and enjoy this process. Beautiful, thank you. Great. You're welcome. All right, does anyone else have any further comments on, oh my God, have we moved on, Robin? I mean, I don't really feel like we've had any comments on Measure 107. I'd really love for folks to be able to chime in uh, whether they think that uh, having campaign finance limits and a process for that is a good thing or a bad thing. All right, so either raise your hand or go ahead and speak up if you'd like to participate. Uh, Phil, go for it. Okay, <clears throat> so um, several of us on this call from Paneor are on what's called the Tukun Olam, which means social action in Hebrew <laughs> committee. We endorsed ballot measure 107. Um, <clears throat> In doing that endorsement process, we looked at the Oregonian endorsed it, Willamette Week endorsed it, Street Roots endorsed it, the ACLU did not endorse it, and I think the ACLU is overly optimistic. The ACLU's analysis is before the Supreme Court decision came down, 
that made it possible under Oregon constitution for ballot measures like those that the county and the city passed overwhelmingly to limit campaign contributions. They were supporting a ballot measure like this, but they don't think it's necessary now and they don't like to amend the constitution. My analysis is there was no harm in doing this. And if they are wrong and it is necessary and we don't have it, we're gonna be in the same situation we have been in where Phil Knight can give a million and a half dollars or is it two and a half million dollars? He, he was not successful in defeating Kate Brown, but everybody who reads the Oregonian remembers the series called Polluted by Money, which is how the timber industry has used contributions. And I think really the threats of making larger contributions to people's opponents to result in Oregon, which thinks of itself as an environmental state having the worst environmental laws of any of the West Coast states. I think that this is a very easy choice and it clearly needs to pass overwhelmingly. Thanks, Phil. Um, as far as I can tell, no one else has raised their hand, but if anyone wants to chime in, three, two, one. All right, All right. let's move on. Move on. Okay. Uh, measure 108 increases cigarette and cigar taxes. It'll uh, we have a last minute dollars. contender, Robin. What's that? We have a last minute. Uh, Michelle would like to speak up. Okay. Sorry, I was just going to add to that. I mean, same thing. I think it, it is overdue to have campaign finance reform in Oregon. Um, I do lobbying at the federal level and I've been at national conferences where lawyers have spoken about these issues and it is kind of funny because they're like, well, Oregon thinks of itself as a progressive state. And when it comes to campaign laws, we're really like the wild west. It's, there's very few states where you can just give unlimited amounts of money like this. And in my work in the federal stuff, there's campaign limits. Um, so I think it just, um, you know, keeps everything a little bit more fair. Um, and we pre probably at every level have quite a ways to go, so. All right, and Signe? I think campaign limits would be great. It'll also protect, like when we have future ballot measures, it'll protect us from big money outside of Oregon, such as, I don't know, the tobacco industry or Coca-Cola so, or Nestle. So I think this is a good, good measure to vote yes on. And then it also, um, maybe other states will be influenced by our vote. Great, thanks, Signe. And apologies to you, Robin, for um, interrupting you. No. Back to you. Okay. So measure 108 uh, increases cigarette and cigar taxes, like two dollars a pack or one dollar per cigar, and it also funds health programs. Uh, and I believe there's also a process about uh, uh, vaping and having some um, policy issues around vaping. All right, anybody out there work in the health field who want to speak on this one? Or anyone want to speak on this one? Erin. Um, I mean, I have a background in public health, not specifically focused on this issue, but when you increase prices, it <laughs> less people, people are going to want to, you know, smoke less and maybe be more of a motivated to quit. Um, so I guess I'm for it. Um, I would love to see a junk food tax as well and then subsidize healthy foods, but that's, that's my perspective. All right, thanks, Erin. Um, Robin wanted me to remind folks, if you wanna raise your hand, it's simply, you go down to the bottom of your screen, click on the word participants. On the right-hand side, you'll see an opportunity to raise your hand. There's a button there that says raise hand. And we have Jay, go ahead, Jay. Okay, um, well, just to let you know, this is, I do work in medicine, so this is a, an area that I do know stuff on. Um, the important part from my perspective is establishing the tax on e-cigarette and vaping devices. Um, studies have found repeatedly over and over again across the years that uh, increased prices on any kind of uh, substances result in uh, lower purchases, even addictive substances. One of the issues that's currently going on with smoking rates is um, 
while traditional smoking uh, has been dropping year over year for many, many years, cigars, cigarettes, et cetera, um, e-cigarettes and vaping are actually having a very different situation, especially amongst younger demographics where there's a much higher use rate compared with traditional methods and um, one of the approaches that a lot of people in public health are advocating for is to put similar taxes on e-cigarettes and vaping in order to um, make it more difficult for younger people to get access to these. Um, there isn't much we can do about the fact that it is, quote, cool. And I, you know, am not a youth target demographic, so I don't know why vaping is apparently cool. But um, given the success that was shown with applying taxes to cigarettes, people are hoping that similar taxes on vaping products will result in younger youth smoking uh, percentages. Okay, thanks. Last call. Three, two, one. All right, on to 109. Okay, 109. <clears throat> so this is the magic mushroom measure. So this allows manufacture, delivery, administration of psilocybin at supervised licensed facilities over, a, and there'll be a two-year process for determining uh, specific regulations regarding this. Okay, Ash, go ahead. Hey, yeah, sorry. This is actually for the previous measure. Um, I just wanted to chime in that uh, um, some of my work in the recovery community and some of my lived experience in the recovery community. Uh, I did a training with Mental Health Association of Oregon. And I remember really, really clearly um, when we had a conversation about the, the cost of cigarettes and, and the marketing targeting um, communities who, who live in poverty, who have the highest levels of stress, um, who are coping with that stress in certain ways that aren't necessarily healthy for their bodies, but who are trying to manage like all of this severe oppression and, and marginalization um, that essentially placing the burden, increased burden onto people who are trying to cope with really high levels of stress. To me, it really sticks out. Like I'll never forget the moment when these folks were talking about um, the cost of cigarettes gets placed on them as opposed to like on the, the cigarette companies who are, who are making all the money, right? So to me, it's like putting an increased burden on the people who are targeted the most heavily are the lowest income people in, in our society. So that's a really important factor for me. Thanks, Ash. Uh, Eric? Well, I was gonna talk about 109. Does this seem like a good? Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, yeah, this is, um, in case there's people out there who, I don't know if this, if they're friends with Albert, I don't know if anyone would already doubt, but there's so much research about the neurogenetic properties of psilocybin mushrooms, the healing on people's brains, um, and incredible success through UCLA, um, Johns Hopkins, through these, um, controlled, um, therapeutic, um, experiences for people to uh, work with magic mushrooms, as they're called, and um, everything from spousal abuse to depression, people dealing with death, people have incredible results, and they're people who are not from, uh, there. a lot of people that they work with are not from a community that's already accepted and embraced, um, you know, hallucinogenics and, and those kinds of things, and that it's so important to um, legalize this and set a trend for the rest of the nation for moving forward. I, I don't personally know how well it's written. So I'm, I'm someone who's voting yes, only based on the idea of it. So I'm open to what others have to say about the, the law, but um, I am 100% uh, in support of it and hope that everyone will legalize it this year. All right, thank you, Eric. I also mm -hmm. wanna put a plug in privately for Eric Fairlayman. And if you wanna put your website up or something, He's one of my favorite massage therapists. Uh, he's also a friend, but he's really quite good. And he has a style of massage that I've never experienced before. So I highly recommend getting in touch. And next up we have Tina. Tina, yeah. Um, well, um, I also have a lot of experience with the psilocybin measure and um, I'm voting no. And I think that a lot of people, we all, I, I would say that most people who are friends with Albert are gonna agree that there are tremendous benefits 
psilocybin, uh, medical, mental health wise, spiritual, um, and um, and I and I agree with that. Um, I think the issue is around equity and accessibility. Um, the original measure um, had a decriminalization clause in it, which meant that. <clears throat> even though legalization would happen, which at this point, it's not even legalization is all it is, is setting up a lot of regulatory boards, a two year process to decide who's going to be licensed. Um, the estimates for this kind of, um, this kind of access is between $1,000 and $1,500 to just get into the system. So what I what what happened is um, this measure was um, got some corporate support from David Bronner. And at the same time that they got that corporate support, um, they dropped the de decriminalization piece in the legislation. And I think that is the thing that really worries me um, <clears throat> because if this goes ahead and we say yes to this, um, most people who really could you have could benefit from access to this medicine are gonna be shut out of the system. Um, if decriminalization was a part of it, that would allow anybody to grow their own. That would allow anybody who wants to take a trip for themselves if they wanna go with a guide. Um, but when decrim is taken out of it, it makes it less likely that um, it, it's gonna be incentivized to get into the system and anyone who's not in the system is most likely gonna be shut out. So I know a little bit more about this thing. I don't, I don't wanna take up too much time, but I just wanna make sure people look more closely into the equity and accessibility of this, which doesn't look good at this point. So Tina, can I just push back and have a little conversation with you about this? Um, um, my sense is for a piece of legislation like this, like mostly, it's kind of moving things in the right direction. And then often legislation then gets taken up by the legislature and they can do all sorts of things with it. They can, you can then lobby them and say, actually we want this in there as well. Or the legislature can push back and go, we don't like what the people voted on. Um, my sense is that Robert, this- they, they can't do that. This is a constitutional amendment. Thanks, Rob. All right, Kat. Well, I was going to say actually what somebody else put in, I think Harriet put into the um, chat also was that this is a very similar process to what we've seen in the last 20 years in Oregon with uh, marijuana is when the first marijuana legalization laws came into place, they were for this very specific slice of medical marijuana and there was a lot of complication and it was more expensive than getting it on the street and you had to have a doctor's notice and all this kind of stuff. and um, I'm connected with therapists who are working um, to set up some of these initial processes for the psilocybin um, to be legal in a therapeutic setting and they would be able to get covered by insurance. And, you know, so this first set of, um, this first measure wouldn't make it necessarily accessible to everyone, but it would potentially make it accessible to veterans with PTSD and a whole, subcategory of people and it will create an opportunity for there to be legal research and so then five ten whatever years down the line um decriminalization will have like something to stand on so even though this isn't like the perfect measure um i don't think the fact that decriminalization isn't part of it makes it a reason not to get it moved forward because once we move it forward then these next pieces can kind of get into the puzzle. All right, thanks, Kat. Um, any last comments from folks? We've had some back and forth on that. Bev, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm with Tina. I pretty much agree with everything that she said. Decriminalization was on the ballot or was working towards getting on the ballot and that was dropped and there's no real answer why. And, you know, there's, I think what a vote yes will do is uphold the status quo and the status quo is for middle class or wealthy white people. There's nothing for marginalized people. 
and overall like isn't that what we're constantly fighting against is the status quo to just help most people it's just kind of sorry tina tina said it way better um but i'm with her basically i'm going to vote no on this okay very good um i saw your note rob and i think no on that okay. um, actually we have a couple more comments though avi go ahead yeah, I'm, I've been looking over the measure, and I don't see anything in there where it specifically says this amends the state constitution. Am I missing that? Yeah, it doesn't amend the So I thought somebody said that this amended the state constitution, and let's be clear that I don't think it does. We couldn't hear what you said, Beth. Um, I think Bev said, no, it doesn't. So okay. I think you're right, Avi. Yeah, no vote uh, retains current law, which prohibits manufacturer. A yes vote allows manufacturer delivery administration and psilocybin. So it doesn't seem like it has anything to do with the um, constitution. I, I will double check that. I thought it was a constitutional amendment. No, it, it, I think if it is, it amends the constitution, like 107, it has to start off with amends constitution. So okay. So I, thank you and sorry about that. My apologies. It's okay. You owe me a beer. Um, actually, I thought we it could be a fun thing. Like if I interrupt you, I owe you a beer. That's not happy. All right. How about we move on to 110 unless, well, actually we have some more. Nicole, go for it. I just had a question about this. If anybody knows the answer, I mean, what's keeping any therapist from doing some kind of like equity work and working with people who are low income on, on helping them get their needs met around the psilocybin therapy issue. Okay, I think that answer is gonna come when Tina is up next. Um, Nicole, are you speaking about if this measure passes or if this measure doesn't pass? Um, actually either, but I was thinking if it passes. Well, um, it's, there's a two-year process and there's going to be a whole bunch of regulatory agencies set up to decide who can do it and who can who can't um i think that once that's set up um the people who are willing to pay into that system are going to be able to work in that system and i think that once that system is set up it's going to be less likely they're going to want to encourage anyone to work outside of that system so <clears throat> my, my feeling is is that decriminalization would allow everyone to work in whatever way they want. So that if some people did want somebody, let's say they wanted somebody who had experience and had some kind of credentials to be a guide, they could have that. And someone who wants to go it alone could also have that. I think that this whole idea of legalization seems fine if there's decrim and if there's decrim included in it. And the reason why I'm hesitant to say that this is a step in the right direction is it's a small step but it's a small step in the wrong direction if we're really interested in accessibility and equity. And so I'm not against this measure as long as there's decrim involved, but once the corporate, once these corporate interests got involved and that's exactly the time that they took out the decrim, it tells us that they're not likely to wanna to go in the other direction. So who knows what's really gonna happen? It's a complicated law. There's a lot of complex things, but I'm clearly, and I'm clearly in favor of accessibility and equity. And I know that people, oh, I know, can't afford $1,000 or $1,500 to get into the system. And maybe insurance will be there, maybe it won't, but does that answer your question? It does. I, it sounds to me very much, I don't want to get into a big you know, conversation about it, but it's, it does sound very similar to the marijuana, like when they set up you know, certain companies could have marijuana shops and you know you had to pay a certain amount for that and so i'm not i'm not opposed to there being a fee especially if maybe therapists could group together and you know figure out how to pay that fee but i understand that the accessibility is actually towards the therapist not necessarily the people that's that's what i'm hearing no it's for anyone if you have the money if you have the money and you're willing to go into the right. health profession and you have a diagnosis and you want to go in there but there's so many people who have been, you know, are, are, are shut out of that system 
and those are the people that could really benefit from this. So it's accessibility for for providers, and it's accessible mainly. It's accessibility for 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 everyone. Okay. Just a point of information. I just want to plant the seed that Measure One Hundred and Ten is the decriminalization measure. So we're going to be getting to that component of it in a minute. Um, yeah, I think I think that's it, it's related in one or nine as well. Ash and Sky. Hey, yeah, um, I just want to ask a clarifying question, Tina. Um, so are you saying that the costs you're referring to, the $1,000 to $15,000, is a cost that would go on the participant, like on the client or the patient, or is it a cost that would be for the provider? No, no, no. If for clients, so I guess what has to happen is there are going to be these clinics set up. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the MDMA work that they're doing now, but they're also doing MDMA work. Basically, it, there are clinics going to be set up. And in order to get in, you have to be um, cleared by a mental health therapist. Once you're in, you are in the system. You have to sign up for so many different, um, uh, you know, uh, appointments and sessions. Um, and so, because it's so highly regulated, which I'm sure is fine, it just is going to require a lot of money. So, I think, and they've quoted a thousand dollars to fifteen hundred dollars as the initial cost of getting care with psilocybin. I, I don't know what it's really gonna be, but those are the numbers that I've heard. Okay, thank you. Um, Blair. So this has nothing to do with the recreational use, right? <laughs> yes, it does not, but we're gonna get to that in a moment. Okay, and so is it still gonna be a schedule A controlled substance? Psilocybin. And w when we get to one one ten, that may affect, I believe, the answer to that question. So if you can just hold on a second. Okay. Um, back off. This this measure does not decriminalize psilocybin, but one ten coming up now. Why don't we switch to one ten? Is in the last call on one oh nine. Anyone? Okay. Robin, you want to? Take us away in 110. Sorry, um, I don't know if this complicates things, but um, under 109, you can you can manufacture and distribute through that licensure uh, the psilocybin. So I'll just throw that out there for what it's worth. Um, measure 110 is the decriminal decriminalization measure. Um, so uh, this is the one that would reclassify possession of specified drugs. Okay, uh, the floor is open. Avi, why don't you hold on a second? Let's see if anyone else would like to speak. You've had a couple of shots at this. Um, anyone else? Okay, well, um, I'll take a moment. Um, just to read the result of a yes vote on this, provides addiction recovery centers, services, marijuana taxes, partially finance, reduces revenues for other purposes, reclassifies possession of sp specified drugs, reduces penalties and requires audits. And I think one of the aspects of this is uh, decriminalizing a lot of different drugs um, that, are, that are, you know, sending people to our prison system. So this is a big one. As far as I know, there's nothing like this in the country so far. So um, Yasmin, go ahead. Coming, I'm coming. This is Mel. Hey, so I did do some reading on this a little bit from um, some grassroots uh, people that are doing advocacy work. And one of their complaints about this was that um, the centers don't actually have treatment beds. It's just about triaging, but there's no actual inpatient treatment beds being added to the state of Oregon. And that was their biggest concern. I didn't know if anybody else had any more thoughts or research on that. Thinking it was there anything else? I think that was my biggest thought or concern about it. I'm not sure you're on the same uh, initiative we are, but- 110, yeah. 110. So about where the money is gonna be going, is that what you're talking about? No, like, so they're saying that these centers are going to have money and they're taking money out of education and other areas, but they're not actually increasing treatment beds 
they're just having centers do more triaging and assessment for drug, for for drug, drug treat treatment. for drug treatment. Oh, okay. So there's no actual saying. drug treatment beds being made. Okay, thank you. Um, Ash and Sky. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm what she was just sharing that um, there's uh, addiction recovery uh, policy work. Folks who have been working on addiction recovery policy uh, arena for a long time um, are a lot of them are in opposition to this, and some of them aren't. The recovery community is actually pretty torn on this. Um, and one of the the organizations that I follow from my personal history and recovery called Oregon Recovers is a strongly in opposition. And I recommend anyone to check it out. I could maybe post a link in the chat. Um, but yes, they are in opposition mostly because uh, it doesn't actually provide any treatment. It provides just assessment. So the actual the language inside the brochure, inside the ballot is actually inaccurate. Um, and Oregon is woefully under um, sourced already in terms of our recovery services. Uh, so what we actually, what, what like there, a lot of the people who are doing policy work for addiction are working toward is providing services first and focusing on decriminalization, maybe secondary or like simultaneously, but not in decriminalizing with when we actually don't have the infrastructure to help people who need recovery treatment. Hmm. Okay, um, Avi? Yeah, this was, um, I see in the comments that Eric uh, makes a reference to the Think Out Loud debate on this particular issue, which was really interesting because both people that were debating it both favor the idea of some kind of decriminalization of small amounts of drugs. But this points to that whole issue of we want progress and we want progressive policies, but we know enough now to know that it's got to be the right progressive policy. If it is poorly done, it's going to create chaos. And the person who was speaking against this was saying that there is no system in place that is provided for by this measure that the money would go to, that we already have insufficient beds and we already have an insufficient system. And this measure would take away money from that system and put it into some pot of money that is yet to be decided where it's gonna go. And he was saying, if you do not have a system in place on day one, then you are going to be short shifting all of the addicts who go through the court system who have the opportunity to be steered to the, towards these community programs. So it seems like the right idea, but done in a poor way. Can I, can I ask you a question, Avi? Yeah. Um, so let's say a person today gets caught with a gram of cocaine and then is shuttled through the police system and through the legal system and ends up spending uh, a week in jail or a day in jail or whatever. So the money from that experience, instead of being spent on all of that aspect of our legal system, police system, um, could potentially instead be going towards treatment. That's sort of how I read this, well, but am I imagining I mean, things? And I mean, I mean, I agree with you and the person who spoke out against this measure, who I think was a part of that um, recovery community that mm -hmm. somebody was talking about, he said that he wants there to be places to go where people do not have to come into contact with police or the court system. Right. But he's saying we've already seen too many times where well-intended policy changes throw money at something without figuring out the details first, which is he says what this measure does. This measure basically throws the money into study groups who are gonna try and figure out what a new system would look like. And yes, it sucks that people have to go to jail and have to deal with courts and judges and police to get drug treatment. But that is the only thing we've got. And if this measure goes through, he said, that would even be the, those people would not even have that option. They would just be cut out into the cold. They would not have any programs to go to until the infrastructure is created. Okay. Thanks. Abby. That's the way um, I understand it. Okay. Kat? Kat? Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of pieces of, of things that are really resonating with me in this conversation. And one is I think about PSEF, right? So the big policy that we passed for, I cannot remember what all the details are, but right, you know, there's a whole lot of money that's been allocated for um, traditionally disadvantaged 
people and communities to do work for energy efficiency and energy upgrades. And I've been watching over the last year how um, those policies, like what that actually looks like and what the process is for applying and getting access to these millions of dollars that are being collected through taxes um, in the city of Portland, um, they've been having to work it out. But the thing is that like, they've been working it out and it's been barely a year and there's some really like solid things in in place and there's some really solid things that are moving forward and it's going to be a really interesting um experiment once again for the city of portland and for our country as a whole at uh, this very unique approach to the subject and so i feel like one of the things that happens in liberal circles is that we argue about the nitty-gritty of things and we don't actually just get things moving in the right direction and this is something and same you know with the 109 too like these are things that are moving in the direction that we want to move in and by actually like saying this is the law and assigning money to it, then there can be people who are going to sit around getting paid to actually solve the question and set this up. Whereas like before the thing gets on the measure, people are doing this in their in their free time. They're not really getting paid to do it. And, um, and I totally understand the question of, well, if somebody's like using drugs and they don't have access to help like at the moment if they get arrested and go to jail then they can get access to services but ideally what we want is it's set up that like drug use is not criminalized and that people can choose to get recovery services when they want to and not be forced to do so because they got arrested for having a small amount of drugs in their hands and this measure to me sounds very much like it's moving in that direction and that, um, yeah, I guess that's what I have to say. Okay, great. Thanks, E. Cole and John. So I want to uh, sort of shift focus on this for just a moment away from the money um, to the equity issue that's on the ballot here. Um, so I was just, you know, looking this up on an OPB article. Um, and they found that uh, Black Oregonians were particularly overrepresented in uh, drug possession cases and convictions. Um, you know, they were 4.7% 4, 4 of the people convicted of drug possession cases, but just 1.9% of Oregon's population. So there's a disparity there. And uh, Measure 110, um, according to the Oregon Criminal Justice Commission's analysis, would uh, in effect, eliminate the disparity in possessing convictions for Black Oregonians. Um, so that that's what I wanted to point to. And I know E. Cole had something to say, too. No, I just feel really similarly. I feel like, you know, I, I totally agree with Kat that it may not be the perfect measure, but, you know, as a bunch of, I don't know who else is on the call, but white liberal people, I think that we need to really consider the fact that the people who are targeted to end up in prison are not necessarily the white all the white, they're, they're people who are people who are considered of the global majority or minorities or whatever it is. And so I just want to be really sensitive to the fact that it may not be a perfect system, but it's definitely in the right direction. And decriminalization, I mean, this is the thing I feel like I've been waiting for for years. I've watched the Michael Moore movies about other countries that have decriminalized, you know, um, drugs and how what an amazing effect it's had on their population. And so, yes, I don't think maybe like the money isn't like perfectly set up and the systems aren't perfectly set up. And but if there's no need, like I'm sorry that the the therapy systems, you know, and the, the drug treatment centers might be overwhelmed. But if they're not overwhelmed, they're not going to have this desperate need. And if they don't have a desperate need, they're not going to create the systems that are going to rectify the situation. So I almost feel like the pressure needs to be put on the system to be forced to come up with the answers. And I do think that having paid people sitting around thinking about what the answers really are best going to be is the right direction to go. Thanks, E. Cole. John Michael? Hi, so um, I haven't read about the measures at all, but I'm a criminal defense investigator. Um, I work for criminal defense attorneys. And, um, you know, whether somebody's put in jail for a day or a week or ends up in prison because it's, uh, 
you know, many repeated drug charges. Um, it's, it's terrible for humans. The system is terrible for humans. Um, people who go into jail and prison, um, they end up getting in more trouble because of the people they meet there. When they're put in prison and in jail, they uh, can't work. They can lose their job because they um, were, they couldn't go to their job. Um, they uh, could be taken away from their kids who uh, really need them. Um, and um, there's also legal fees that they may end up having to pay uh, either for their own defense or you know, to the court for various things. Um, it's, just, it's just a horrible way to deal with um, drug addiction, people who need help. Um, so yes, there is diversion. Um, you know, some people do get into the system and they don't get uh, put in prison or jail and they get shunted into programs. Um, but, you know, to me, there's much better ways to do that, to get people into treatment than to threaten them with jail and prison or put them in jail and prison. Um, and I think, I mean, my, my guess is that we're more likely to uh, get in that direction of getting, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out how to get people into, into the treatment they need, um, you know, if we can change the law. Great, thank you. Um, Ash and Scott? Yeah, thanks. I appreciate this conversation. It's really rich. And I really appreciate bringing in the, um, the comments about equity. I think that that's really valid. Um, I just wanted to chime in a little bit about um, Kat, some of the comments that you made uh, regarding essentially like incremental change versus like, you know, the all, the, the, the full change that we're seeking. Um, so just so everyone understands, there is actually a full movement happening, like in our state and in our nation now, finally, around addiction services and, and an improvement of how we deal with addiction. So um, this hasn't been a topic that has been talked about for quite a, like, for very long, but it's actually becoming uh, much more popular in the political arena. Um, so the shifts are coming regardless, like there's a lot of people who are doing policy work around addiction. Um, and, and pretty much virtually everyone who's doing this work is really, really pro decriminalization. But like, like like Avi was saying, there are certain there's certain people who are advocating for for doing it in a way that actually supports folks, and um, and yeah yeah I think that I, I think that there's a better way that, that decriminalization can be written, um, but yeah, the movement is out there. And um, in terms of also the the comments about folks making about whether folks like voluntarily want to go into treatment versus mandated treatment. Um, from my personal lived experience and working with with folks, participants who are dealing with addiction, um, a lot of people I've seen and worked with who come in to services mandated by courts actually end up becoming devoted to recovery. And I, I worked with a lot of folks in the mental health field who also went through their own recovery process and work as a, you know recovery counselors now, addiction counselors are now. <clears throat> And every single one of them actually ended up in those systems because they were mandated by court. I'm not saying they're, that it's that it's the good system, but it, it's not necessarily totally ineffective. And I think it's important for folks to understand that. Thanks, Ash. And Tina, why don't you take us out on this measure? Um, I just wanted to say one more thing about decriminalizing, and it's a little bit going back to one on nine because they're kind of related. Um, in terms of decriminalizing. Um, psilocybin and, and the plant medicines, there's another option um, that's very popular right now, which is an organization called Decriminalized Nature. And they've already um, gotten psilocybin and plant medicines decriminalized in Oakland, Denver, and a couple of other places. It's a different, it's a different process. They go to city legislatures and they ask the legislatures to devote zero um, finances to funding to police to apprehend any drug drug cases. And so that has been an effective way that's actually happening right now of decriminalization. And if that kind of thing happened, at least with the psilocybin, we'd be in a much better place in terms of hopping onto the legalization. I know I'm going back to 109, but I do want to say that there is another option that's actually happening now in terms of decrim. And their, their whole organization is based on education and, um, it, and equity and access. Awesome. Thank you very much, Tina. Um, thanks, everybody, so far for hanging in there. We've had a lot of participation. Um, 
bump from everyone and we've gone through the state measures now and also the uh, state uh, and city offices and next up we're going to move on to county measures and then we're going to do city measures and Portland school district measures so um, we may have some time ahead of us um, if you need to take a break and use the bathroom um, feel free we're recording so I think we're just going to keep on rolling and if you miss part of this at the end you're welcome to come back and see the um, the replay it'll be on my youtube channel uh, which i can it's my name youtube.com forward slash albert kaufman and it'll be up there um you know probably tomorrow so without further ado robin you want to introduce county measures sounds good and i also just want to comment by saying everybody's just it's it's so thoughtful and i really appreciate the dialogue that we're having tonight yeah okay so this is the library bond measure so this would allow the county to issue 387 million dollars in general obligation bonds to be used for a new flagship library in Gresham. It would renovate seven other library branches and it would add gig speed internet to all the libraries. It also would add a mechanical sorting equipment for books and some other, uh, and some other items, but those are the major items. Okay, Tina. Well, I don't have my hand up, but I don't <laughs> This. It was up for the last measure. Sorry. Does anyone have any uh, information or interest in supporting or? Okay, no one does. So why don't we just move on? Okay, this is the. I, I just had a question on that one. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I posted it in the chat. Maybe I'll just let that go if anybody knows. Um, Sounds good. Thanks, Sarah. Is there a limit on sure there is a limit on spending. Limit on spending. It's, it's three hundred eighty-seven million dollar bond. Is that is that your question? I'm assuming so. Um, okay. The next one is the pre-K measure. Uh, so this would allow for uh, preschool for all funding, um, which would create a basically a high net worth tax. Uh, it would be a tax that's graduated on incomes and I apologize, I believe it's, you bear with me one second, 200,000 for joint filers, $125,000 for single filers. So if you make less than 200,000 joint, 125 single, um, you won't get taxed. If you make that level, then you'll get 1.5% of your income 1.5% of your income will be taxed. And then that's graduated as you uh, earn more money above that threshold. Uh, allegedly 92% of all residents will not be taxed. Well, yes, <laughs> that's what I have to say. Oh my God, pre for all is so, I, I, will, I will pay into that one. Um, I'll, I'll make more money so I can pay into that one. Anyway, uh, go ahead, Jay. Bye. I'm just going to out myself as one of the people who would be taxed. This is exactly why I would want to pay taxes. If this is, I, I, as one of the people in that um, income level, I am more than happy to pay taxes for preschool for all kids. I'm voting yes, even though my taxes are going to go up. Thank you. Ash and Sky. Hey, yeah, this is Sky again. Thanks for letting me talk. <laughs> this is my last comment. Um, so I actually do work in child care policy. So I'm pretty familiar with some of the states and the conditions that we're experiencing in Oregon. Um, so in Oregon, we have what is called like a tremendous amount of what is called child care deserts, which means that there's only one. What, what, what qualifies as a child care desert is if there's only if there's a, min a maximum of one slot per three children in demand for needing uh, child care services. Um, and our entire state is a child care desert for ages one through five. So that includes preschool. Um, most of our counties in Oregon are child care deserts for ages zero to three. Um, Multnomah County actually is not a child care desert for preschool. So unfortunately, this won't actually meet the highest demands of our state. Uh, but it's kind of, um, it's a it's, it's a program that like hopefully will expand to meet the rest of our state's needs. Um, <clears throat> additionally, in terms of affordability for childcare, uh, childcare costs have increased tremendously in the last 10 years. Childcare tuition uh, is at the rate of um, college tuition, like an average 
tuition at our state colleges. Uh, and um, the state, ben uh, the federal benchmark for childcare costs, uh, it should be a third of our, um, um, oh, I forgot. Sorry, okay, I can't remember exactly the number, but um, there's a federal benchmark for how much childcare should cost to be affordable. Um, and it is like substantially higher than that, our average cost of childcare in the state. So in terms of access and affordability, uh, we're woefully under, under supporting our, our families. So I'm highly in support of, of more childcare services. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I think that's it for um, preschool for all program. So city of Portland measures. Okay, so the next one is the parks levy. So this is for a five year operating levy. Um, and just as a point of information, this will taxes are capped at an annual increase of 3% per year. This ballot measure allows for taxes to go in excess of 3% per year uh, due to this one. And it's uh, intended to fund parks, nature, uh, clean water programs, recreation programs, and restoration measure, uh, methods. Okay, so far no one has raised hands. Anybody wanna speak on this? Um, yeah, just in the... So decide on your own, I suppose. Um, any last call? All right, next one. Uh, the next one is the Police Oversight uh, Review Board uh, modification. Uh, this is the one being put forward by Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, currently, we have a system which is questionable as far as its effectiveness. This would create, this would make a wholesale change to that and would allow for an independent community police oversight board to investigate complaints against Portland police. Um, and um, I'm not quite sure about the methodology of it, but I know that it's a sea change from what has currently been in place. Okay, anybody like to speak up on this one? Okay, Jay, am I saying your name right, by the way? Yes, it's like the letter. Suddenly I have a lot to say. I think um, my real big question about this one is, well, I should rephrase this. My concern or my wish is that this police oversight board is not staffed or affected by police officers or previous police officers. I feel like it kind of needs to be separate. And also what type of actual effect or discipline would they would they be able to do? Um, you know, one of the big issues with firing police officers or instilling any form of discipline is that police unions have very strong contracts and they essentially get everything reversed by going to court. So I'm I'm curious to know if this will actually really make a change um, because I do feel like we need a much better system than we have now. All so right. I don't, I don't that, know if anyone knows the answer to that. Yeah, that may be something that you're going to need to do some research on. I can answer yes. most of these questions. I'm on the steering committee. I'll go last. Uh, Philip, last is now. Have at it. Now, okay. So let me address Jay's questions first. <clears throat> so this is the beginning of an 18-month process of the design, specifically, as compared with generally of what this is gonna be. And there's gonna be a huge amount of community involvement. The oversight commission will be, will give, will, will give, emphasize having members of affected communities, minorities, mentally ill and such like. There's only one class of people who will not be able to serve on it, which addresses one of your concerns, Jay. No police officers, no members of police officers' family. I think no former police officers, but I'm not 100% sure about that. When there are police officers, and there are certainly some of them, who are completely in alignment with the objectives of this, they can be witnesses, but they cannot be on the commission because they do not, 
this is designed specifically, I mean, this is Joanne Hardesty's work. She's been working on these issues for 30 years. And, you know, she's a black woman uh, and she has um, no particular love for police misconduct. Um, so it is designed to make sure that the system is not going to be dominated or even affected by police officers. It's true that, as you say, the police union contract at this point is torqued in favor of the police. Joanne Hardesty, if she has the right Portland City Council behind her, is going to make those officers pay in spades. The contract will be hugely different. That is a political question. That will not be decided in November. It will be influenced in November. If anybody looks at their ballot guide, the voters pamphlet, there's a huge number of arguments in favor. There are zero, none in opposition. There is no money being spent by the police union in opposition. They have given up. They know they can't win. They will probably, and the goal is to get 80 or 85% yes, rather than 70% yes, to create momentum for the next 18 months. We don't know for sure where they are going to attack. They probably will try to water down the process. They certainly are going to argue that city council has no power <clears throat> to do this as long as the contract says what it says. I think they're wrong about that, but I'm not a labor lawyer, but I know one thing for sure. If the contract changes, they don't have a leg to stand on. What are they gonna do? Go out and strike? The city gonna support the police when they have the blue flu? I don't think so. Not if they voted 80% in favor. Okay, There's Phil. another problem. Can I just address arbitration? You could, Arbitra but you're getting so deep into inside baseball. I think we Okay, are, I mean, there's, but it's a very complicated process. It's not, you do not just vote yes. You may want to volunteer to work with us. It's realpoliceaccountability.org for the next 18 months. And the arbitration stuff is legislative. Lou Frederick is driving that bus. Police arbitration likely in the next legislature is not going to be like it is now, where every time there's discipline, an arbitrator comes in and says, the city, you have to pay damages because this poor police officer who's killed somebody was improperly dismissed. Okay, Phil, thank you for that. And um, thanks for serving on the commission. And I, feel I, free to also my, add my in- pleasure. And thank also you. add in your the link that you just mentioned into the chat area for people. Okay, uh, moving on to city Portland measure 26219. Okay, so this one is an interesting one. So this, um, allows for the water, so the Water Bureau cl collects fees that we all pay into, and this allows them to use fees for purposes that are not specific Water Bureau uses, uh, including lands and uh, to be determined um, definition of, of, uh, of usage. Tina, did you have a comment on this one? Uh, you're speaking, but I cannot hear you. Um, that was my um, raise hand from three questions ago, but I just will say this in terms of the police accountability stuff, the current measure of the current um, board that was supposed to be police accountability, um, a majority of the members left the committee because it was so ineffective. Right. Robin? Um, 26 to 219. Well, let me just see if anybody else wants to comment on it before I do. No one? Okay. So I'm actually voting no on this one. And on the surface, it sounds good, but the fine print says that the council can spend water fund monies on general public, quote, incidental uses. And that's undefined. And they specify that in the ballot measure that it's undefined. And even Commissioner Fritz's voter statement clarifies that spending may include neighborhood green spaces, community gardens, picnic benches, which all seem like money that should come from the general fund or parks department budget, in my opinion. Um, I'm really concerned that the measure would allow the council to raise water rates and pay for costs that are created through these incidental uses. I'm all for the Water Bureau having plenty of money 
and to use it for core services and to improve uh, infrastructure that they have or parks that they have. But the way that the ballot measure is written, it is much too liberal, much too expansive. And um, if they had defined incidental uses, I'd be supportive of it, but they haven't. They've left that open-ended. So I'm voting no on this um, because of that vagueness. Okay. I think um, for people who want a little more inside information on this, this is sort of Amanda Fritz, uh, her eight, one of the issues that she cares about and she's headed out the door as a city council person. And um, she would very much like us to vote in favor of this. I'm also sort of a little, I've got her now, I've got some stuff up about the water bureau. And so I, I'm not sure where I'm voting exactly, but um, it's something to look at. And I appreciate your insight, Robin. Um, how about 26 to 18 Metro measure? Okay. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, Kat. Kat had her hand up. Yeah, I was just gonna say that I was, you know, I was reading through it and I think, you know, they mentioned specifically Dodge Park, Powell Butte and other hydro parks. So, I mean, I, I agree that it's vague and I would want to know more specifically like what they were gonna do. But if those parks are not part of Portland parks, is that the issue? Like that if they're gonna do maintenance on those parks that those have to come out of the water budget? Like there's just some confusion for me about what actually is happening there. Um, I mean, I'm in favor of those parks being maintained, but yeah. Sure, so the ballot measure would allow for those parks to be maintained and to have infrastructure there, um, have funds from our various payments go towards that. Um, and I'm all for that. Uh, but unfortunately, it, it is vague. To, it doesn't stop there. And, and that's my concern. And I just think it was a poorly written ballot measure. Um, I love Amanda Fritz. I think she's done a great job. But this one just wasn't written properly. And by, uh, if you look at the verbiage of the ballot measure, it uses the word undefined and uh, a, a future process will define it. And because of that, uh, it's just open-ended that it could be used for anything, uh, not just hydro parks. Um, I wish they had limited just to hydro parks, then I'd be very supportive of it. Okay, two more to go, 26 to 18 Metro. Okay, so this has gotten a lot of attention. So um, this is the transportation, the regional transportation measure. And this asks whether Metro should fund roads, transit, safety improvements, bridge repair, transportation programs by establishing a tax on certain employers, 0.75% of payroll. Um, for information purposes, I'll say this is only an employer tax. It's only for an employer tax at a certain level. Um, it does not have any bearing on individual taxes. Okay, the floor is open. Well, there we go, Aaron, great. Hey, good to see everyone. Uh, I'll be brief, I'm a transportation planner and everyone that I know from the, you know, the professional sector to elected officials who are very active to advocates are in favor of this. There is some awkwardness because it was developed and designed over the last year before COVID and the slowdown in, in traffic. So there's some questions about whether all these projects are needed, but I, th I don't think we will remain this kind of you know, low activity for um, the extended future. Um, that said, you know, it's, it's a lot of the opposition highlights the spending on the um, Southwest corridor light rail, and it is a very expensive project that I actually don't support, but that's a small share of the project of the total funding package. And that actually allows the region to get matching federal money, which is a huge benefit. And so a lot of this money that is collected for this bond will be multiplied by matching funds from other sources. So it's um, not perfect, but I, I'm going to support it. And it has projects all over the region. It's, it's identified like 15 corridors and their bus improvements, some car and traffic issues, bus, um, sorry, I said bus, but uh, and light rail max to um, Tigard which is what opponents try to highlight, but it's not everything. So I don't think it's perfect, but I think it's gonna be beneficial on balance. 
yeah, um, I'll just say two, two cents about it. I have a sense, and maybe you do too, that a great time to work on transportation projects is when people aren't transporting so much. And so for instance, the Hawthorne uh, project, I wish they had started a year ago because by now it would be done. And all this time there's been people not being on Hawthorne so much. So my sense is with this is that it's gonna dovetail well with us still being at home for a while and also federal funding for infrastructure projects, which I predict are gonna start pouring in once uh, Trumpy and company are out of, out of town. Um, thank you, Avi, for your kindness. And uh, any last thoughts on this measure, 26218? It's a big one. It's gonna be with us for 10 years. Um, you know, what's interesting is that this one's supposedly gonna raise $7 billion. Seattle passed one recently um, just for light rail that was something like $25 billion. So I think we, uh, it'll be interesting to see how this affects our lives. Um, Harriet? Yeah, I'm here with Scott. We both have a question, but he's gonna go first. Thank you. Uh, thanks for letting me join in at this last, uh, at the end here. Um, my, my question to the group is, how do we find out about specifically what projects are in this? Because I'm, I'm very concerned about investing in the same old transportation instead of investing in a transformative transportation system. So I really need to know details about the projects, what they are before I can support this, um, given the vast amount of money. So um, yeah, anybody have any information on that? I uh, highly recommend just hop on the website. I'm sure there's a pro campaign website, which will detail it out or the Metro website. Okay. Um, any others? Okay, Robin. Joni? So, um, Joni, go ahead. Yehuda son Caleb works for Metro. So he's a good resource. Um, if Scott wanted to talk to him, I can. Oh, can and he's in favor of this. Okay, and Signa? One concern I have is this COVID has been a challenge for small businesses. So with this increase in tax, how much of a burden would they have to carry? Because some of them are just barely breaking even. So, you know, I think the timing is not so good. And so I just wonder how small businesses would be affected by this. Um, my sense, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the point, the zero point seven five percent of payroll that is taxed is not being taxed on small businesses? It's you have to have a pretty significant threshold to be contributing into the system. So, like Nike and Intel and OHSU and places like that are going to be the ones that are funding this. That would be my that's my sense of it. It does say twenty five employees or more. I'll just jump in. Okay. So if, if I may, um, my my information on this, I I know someone that works at Metro, um, is that early on when this was put forward pre-COVID, um, the business community was behind it, and um, with receipts falling, uh, they've now pulled their support and it's easy to be a mom and pop restaurant and have 25 employees. So it's not just Nike. Um, I run a small business myself. Um, so, so just consider if, if you want your, your small, cool businesses that make keep Portland weird. Um, I just think I, the timing's unfortunate and that maybe they could put it forward um, after we recover some. Okay, thanks. Um, Harriet and Scott, did you have more or did I just? Oh, I, I um, put my hand up before Lark spoke, right. but that's what I've gotten from reading through the opposition. Small business, the, the uh, uh, organization, Portland Business Alliance vote no because of the timing that all the businesses are suffering and they're, they're having to cut even Nike um, uh, and just the timing is off. So my question is, when we have new administration in the feds, 
don't we aren't we going to expect there to be more matching funds for uh, and maybe even more funding for these kinds of projects that aren't going to burden our employers mm. you know what's not related to this but it's interesting that the city council just recently pulled their support for the i5 rose quarter project that's another topic it's not on the ballot but um okay like, so, well, let me just jump in to say uh go ahead, Robin. there's no certainty about the fed uh sending funds our way and i think this is a good time for me to make a plug uh peter defazio who's in central oregon oversees a lot of these transportation dollars and has steered a lot of transportation dollars to oregon and is in significant jeopardy of losing his race to an upstart Republican. And so if you have time, effort, energy, and wanna impact the federal election closer to home, I just wanna put in a very strong plug for Peter DeFazio. He's a fantastic progressive. And if you want these transportation dollars to come our way, um, please consider um, volunteering for him uh, at peterdefazio.com because that is a very competitive race that shouldn't be. Um, and it's right in our backyard. Okay, last but not least, Portland School District Measure 26 to 15. Yes, so this one is uh, designed to completely overhaul Benson and Jefferson High Schools. And it is about a one point, I think it's like a $1.2 billion, yeah, $1.2 billion ballot measure. So this is specific for those two schools. Okay, anybody have any input? Okay. Well, um, it's been a pleasure being with all of you tonight. Thank you to my co-host Robin. And if people wanna hang out for a while and schmooze, um, we can either do some breakout rooms and people can hang out with each other or I'm just gonna leave the meeting running and sit here for a few minutes just to catch up with people who um, wanna catch up with me and each other. So thank you very much again, Robin. You did a great job. Any summary thoughts you wanna say? I just really appreciated all the comments. It's so good to see everybody here. It's so exciting to see everybody engaged and, uh, and focused on this election. And just thanks for all the, all the really wise uh, insights and comments tonight. Thanks, uh, thanks to everybody. Very good. Good night. Well. <laughs>